Andrew, ready? Great. Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us here at the Hoover Institution. Um, I wrote some comments down. I think they're in order. <laughs> Um, I'm Tim Kane, a J.P. Conte Research Fellow in Immigration Studies here at the Hoover Institution in our D.C. office. And I uh, wanted to welcome you where I have the pleasure of discussing immigration with the renowned Andrew Seeley, who's the president of the Migration Policy Institute. We'll be talking about his book, uh, Vanishing Frontiers. Now, I wanted to tell you a little story. I, uh, I first got this book, I mean literally this book, about uh, three or four months ago when Mike Frank, who runs the Hoover office, um, said, Tim, have you seen have you seen this book? It's really amazing. And you know, he knows I research and study immigration, and I hadn't seen it. So I've kept this and marked it up and made notes in it, and I, and I opened it again this morning as I was preparing, and the very front page says Mike Frank. So, <laughs> my, and it's actually got, it, this was signed from Andrew to you, uh, which I think I got done at lunch a little while ago. Oh, right. I said it was Mike. <laughs> so I owe you this back, but it's worth a lot more uh, now. Um, anyway, it, it really was a delightful book. I think Vanishing Frontiers is the book that you should be reading if you want to understand U.S.-Mexico relations now. Um, it, it has a great amount of history, but it also talks about this transformation that's gone on uh, in the last 20 years, and just chapter after chapter about investment, uh, not just immigration, about trade, about culture. Um, it's, it's fascinating, it's well written, and it's well done. So I'm excited. Andrew, to hear your talk. Now, let me do an introduction, though, and tell you who Andrew Seeley is. Um, his research focuses on migration globally, with a special emphasis on immigration policies in Latin America and the United States. He's the author of several books, including the one we'll discuss today, Vanishing Frontiers, The Forces Driving Mexico and the United States Together. The book was widely and well-reviewed uh, in The Economist, in The Wall Street Journal, and other locations. Um, Andrew's also the adjunct professor at both Johns Hopkins and George Washington University and was a visiting scholar at El Colegio de Mexico. He holds a PhD in policy studies from the University of Maryland, MA in Latin American studies uh, from UC San Diego, which we hold in common. Right, we do. And uh, he's selected as an Andrew Carnegie Fellow in the 2017-2018 period. So um, I'm going to ask you to open with about 10 minutes of conversation uh, or, or discussion of your book, and really th the issues that are facing us right now. We're four days away from another government shutdown if the U.S. Congress can't come to an agreement on immigration reform. And there seems to be a screamingly obvious compromise uh, that maybe you can see and maybe I can see. And so I'm really curious what your take is on, on the issue in general and in the context of this. After those 10 minutes, we'll have a little bit of a guided discussion in the Q&A, and we'll welcome your questions. So, Andrew, welcome. Well, Tim, thanks for having me here. This is, it's great to be here. It's great to be at Hoover. Um, and we've had a lot of chance to talk about immigration politics. I'm actually punt on the question of immigration politics and come back to that. Sounds for, good. For you and I can go back and forth on that. Um, and I know there's other people in the room that think a lot about this as well, so we, we should have a good discussion on immigration politics. Um, I, I wrote this book because Mexico, I, one is I've spent a lot of time in Mexico and between Mexico and the United States and trying to think about how we're connected as two countries. Um, but it also holds a special place in our in our discourse and our thinking in the United States. I mean, this is a country that seems to keep popping up. We're, we're about to, to go into potentially another government shutdown, mm -hmm. probably not, but we might, over a border fence wall barrier, call it what you will, on the U.S.-Mexico border, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, you know, Mexico comes up, you know, NAFTA comes up as a, as an epithet. I mean, this is, it is a constant in our life in the United States. And so I started writing a book about Mexico and I ended up writing a book about the United States and about how the United States is connected to Mexico. And I wanted to tell a series of stories that I think add up to a narrative about how we are connected to Mexico in surprising and unusual ways. Mm -hmm. And so one of the stories, I'm going to tell you a couple stories, actually, and, and just as, an, as an, uh, a starting point, one of the stories has to do with the border. Since President Trump is at the border today and protesters are at the border protesting President Trump, and you know we're, we're back to border redux again, um, he's in El Paso, where, where I was about a month ago. I'm not going to talk about El Paso, but there's a great story about, about San Diego. Because El Paso is actually, for those that have been to El Paso, Texas, El Paso is deeply connected to, to Ciudad Juarez. The two downtowns are right next to each other. I, I looked out my hotel window the night I got to El Paso, and there's you know, Juarez, actually, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're deeply connected. You can move back and forth in a matter of minutes if there's not too much 
border traffic. San Diego and Tijuana are different, different however. And I lived in, in both Tijuana and San Diego in the mid-1990s for about seven and a half years combined. Um, and they were really different cities. Tijuana was this rough and tumble city. San Diego was this too pretty to be true city. Kind of slightly boring. I'm sorry, is anyone from San Diego, by the way? It's a little too, too a little slightly, you kind of are. You know, it was a little bit on the boring side, but, but really nice. I mean, really nice city to live in. Tijuana was really fascinating, but a rough and tumble place. And they're physically separate, right? The downtowns are good, even if you don't have border traffic. You know, there's no one checking your passport. It's still a good 20 to 30 minutes if you're, you're really hauling it to get from one side to the other. And it's not, San Diego's the one city on the border that does not have the same level of Mexican heritage that the rest of the border does, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it does have a large Mexican imprint, but it's not in the same way. It's not majority Mexican descent in any way. And these were very different towns, and, and I used to think, you know, there's no way that San Diego and Tijuana will ever come together. And the big debate in San Diego was always about what to do with their airport, actually. When those airplanes flown into that San Diego airport, it's scary to fly into, right? You're in the middle of downtown and mm. got the Marines on one side, the, you know, the bay on the other, and all the buildings in downtown. Scary place. And, and <clears throat> if you want to be San Diego, what happened actually in the last 20 years is San Diego became a city of innovation. San Diego began to think about how they could connect to the rest of the world, not for tourism, which had been San Diego's big industry, but because they were a city of innovation and they needed to be connected primarily to Asia right, as well as to the rest of the United States and to the rest of the world. And you can't do that with a tiny airport that has one runway and can't take large airplanes. And um, meanwhile, Tijuana was developing in ways that I would never have predicted in the 1990s. It was becoming a very sophisticated town, Jim, you know, Tijuana, becoming a much more sophisticated place um, that was actually a lot more like San Diego than anyone would have imagined. It was becoming more of a middle-class city, moving into advanced manufacturing. Its industry was becoming very tied into the industry in San Diego. And so increasingly, these were actually similar cities. And somewhere along the way, it occurred to people in San Diego that the best answer for building an airport in San Diego was not to build an airport. It was actually to use the Tijuana Airport which is much larger, which already had flights, has two large runways, much longer than San Diego's, already had flights to China and Japan, and was about to have flights to Korea, now has flights to Korea, and is right on the border. And so instead of building a new airport in San Diego, all you had to do was actually build a bridge over the border fence and attach yourself to the Tijuana Airport. And that's what they did. Okay, so three years ago, they opened a bridge that goes across the, the border fence. It's a Star Wars looking, I think it's how I describe it. It's sort of like a Star Wars set. And it goes over the rinky blue border fence down below, and it connects San Diego to the Tijuana Airport. And you check in in English or Spanish in what feels like the United States. You park in the U.S. side. You cross the bridge. They very quickly check your passport and check you in customs, but it's actually quite quick. And you go to your gate as though you were in San Diego. And this becomes sort of the ultimate si symbol of the two cities connecting themselves. Mm -hmm. And it set off a set of conversations between San Diego and Tijuana about what else they can do together. And so I have uh, Mayor Faulkner in, in, of San Diego in the book talking about how, you know, we don't talk about two cities, we talk about one metro region. Increasingly, they think of themselves as one metro region. And I should say, you know, that Mayor Faulkner is a Republican, right? Mm -hmm. This is not, mm -hmm. you know, this is not sort of a you know, let's all get together and have a good time, California about California stuff. This is pragmatic thinking about how the, com how the two cities are economically connected. So they do a lot of regional planning together. They do a lot of planning in terms of they've actually tried to open a new border port, so they've done a great deal of investment in that. Um, they have <coughs> Tijuana and Baja California representatives on the Regional Planning Council for San Diego's uh, Council of Governments. It's become a very creative binational metro area. It's actually fascinating. And so when you go there, you, you know, when we talk about the border in Washington, we tend to be talking about one thing, right? We're talking about a scary place that people are pouring across. When you're actually at the border, people are talking about opportunity. They are scared about some of the same things, by the way. We can come, we'll talk about immigration. It's not that there aren't problems, right? And they're, they're actually scared. They're worried about some of the things that come with immigration and organized crime. And then they're really worried about some of the solutions that come out of Washington and Mexico City as well. So, I mean, they, you know, they get scared both ways on this. But, but for the most part, they think of each other as partners in trying to, to move themselves ahead. And, you know, this was driven ultimately by San Diego and Tijuana. Well, San Diego <laughs> wanting to compete with Los Angeles and San Francisco in the Bay Area and Tijuana wanting to become a modern city and, and sort of a first-class city of Mexico. But it turns out the border is, is everywhere. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you watch the, uh, not the Grammys last night, uh, not much on Mexico there, but, but you, if, you, if you follow the BAFTAs or if you follow the Golden Globes, if you're going to watch the Oscars, you know, for the last five Oscar-winning directors um, for Best Director are Mexican. Mm 
huge, I have a chapter on the film industries in, in the two countries and how much for the last five, and, and it, I mean, the, the favorite going into the next one is also Mexican, right? It's Alfonso Cuaron. Could be five out of six. Something happened between the film industries between Hollywood and Mexico City and Guadalajara, where the film industry is sort of jointly based, and Hollywood in the United States, that tells you there's a deeper connection that maybe we've missed along the way. And so I try and tease that out in the book, about how the film industries actually ended up getting connected. And Hollywood, you could kind of believe, Los Angeles is not that far away. Los Angeles, like San Antonio, is kind of a border city, right? Like Monterrey, Mexico. It's a little couple hours away, three hours away. But, but the book actually opens, and with this I'll, I'll end, it opens with a, a story that's much further away, which is actually Hazleton, Pennsylvania. Um, Hazleton, Pennsylvania is actually 2,000 miles. I checked it. Um, I, somewhere I have the actual calculations. About 2,000 miles away from, from the border. Um, it is not a border city by anyone's calculation, and yet I would argue to that almost everywhere in the United States is a border city today, and almost everywhere in Mexico is also a border city, mm -hmm. because the relationship has expanded in such a way that while San Diego and Tijuana may be especially intense, there may be something unique about that relationship mm. because of <coughs> distance, you, could, you can't replicate that between Hazleton and Puebla in Mexico, for example, but the ties are almost as deep. And Hazleton's a city, you all remember Hazleton from the headlines back in 2006. It was the first city that had local ordinances that were trying, that made it illegal to rent to, oh, you good to see it. made it illegal to rent to people who were, uh, couldn't prove their legal status in the United States or to, to rent to them or to provide them with a job. And English became the only, the official language of the city of Hazleton. Um, Hazleton is a city that went through an enormous boom of immigration. Although most people were actually already in New York, New Jersey area. But people, Mexicans first and later Dominicans, moving in. The city today is about half Latino, not all immigrant. Actually, a lot of, most of the kids are U.S. born, but immigrant families. A city mm -hmm. that went through an enormous demographic change from being an almost white, historically Eastern European, Irish, and Italian background city. And a city that really carries its ethnic heritage on its sleeve now has a whole other layer of ethnic identity added onto it. And not surprising, this would generate enormous pushback, right? It would generate t tensions in the community. What got me to go to Hazleton, though, was, was a, a fascinating thing that I noticed along the way, which was that there was a, a, a Mexican company named Bimbo. Does anyone know what Bimbo is? They make baked goods. They make baked goods. Biggest baked good country, company in the world. Bimbo is, in the United States, it's Entenmann's, it's Sara Lee, it's Oro Wheat, it's Stroman's Amish Bread, not so Amish. It's Thomas English Muffins, not as British as it used to be. Um, you know, this is, Bimbo is the largest baked goods company in the world, but also in the United States. It's about a quarter of all baked goods that we consume in the United States, fresh, fresh baked goods. Um, two of their plants are actually in Hazleton. And so that struck me as sort of an interesting story. I mean, mm -hmm. here 10 years after, and at that point it wasn't even 10 years. That was in about 2009, I think I started going. There was one plant of Bimbo, and then there was another plant um, because they had acquired some companies along the way. I thought, there's a story going on here. Is, so this debate over immigration and sort of human capital flowing across the border, and now suddenly you have financial capital flowing across the border and connecting us in unusual ways. And then I realized along the way, at one point I was, this, the book opens with a, the story of a, of a restaurant owner in, in Hazleton, and I'm in his, his restaurant, and I'm reading that there's, well, people are being hired for mission tortillas um, in the town next door, which is also a Mexican company. That's Gruma in Mexico, for those that know Mexico. Um, it's mission tortillas. Um, one of the major employers in the city also is Mission Tortillas, another Mexican company. And then Wise Potato Chips, somewhere along the way. And when, we all know Wise Potato Chips, right? I mean, this is it's an East, East Coast phenomenon. Wise Potato Chips, the official potato chips of the New York Mets and the Boston Red Sox, also owned by a Mexican company, it turns out. I did, it took me a while to discover this along the way. So four, and, and right next to Hazleton, another town that's right next. So four of the largest employers in and around Hazleton are actually Mexican companies. Now, this is not to say Mexican companies are taking over the world. I'm, I'm not trying to start like a Mexico scare, like a China scare, right? This is sort of, you know, they hear Mexicans are taking over everything. That is not true either. It's simply to point out how unusual these connections are, right? And it, it is true when you're at the border that these connections are much more intense than unusual, but it turns out the border is increasingly everywhere we are, even in a place like Hazleton, which where historically immigration was, was incredibly foreign, but it turns out now it's a mixture of immigration, it's a mixture of small businesses, because Hazleton's gone through an incredible economic revival, 
Actually, it's a beautiful city. I highly recommend it, by the way. Um, great city. It's gone through an economic revival, thanks in part to small business owners who are immigrant who have moved in, mostly Mexican and Dominican, but increasingly from everywhere, um, in a city that's really turning itself around in a lot of ways after a period of, after a long period of decline, after the coal mines closed down. And it's a city that has a lot of investment from Mexico. And so all these unusual connections happen. And so that's why I wrote this book in the end. Mm -hmm. um, it does not... <clears throat> That said, and with this I will end because it will get to your question, it will get us back into this terrain. Um, I would say the issue of immigration is not a, a non-issue at the border. Mm -hmm. If you ask people in San Diego, their solution to immigration is not to build a wall across 2,000 miles mm. of border. But that doesn't mean, you know, you couldn't get a majority opinion for that. But it doesn't mean they aren't concerned about immigration. And if you ask people in Hazleton, you will get very different senses of what to do. Hazleton voted overwhelmingly for President Trump after being a mostly democratic city. Um, and it largely is seen by politicians on the ground there as a bellwether on immigration, of a real sort of sense of frustration mm -hmm. about demographic change <coughs> and about feeling that even though the city is better off, that perhaps those that have been there a long time have not benefited equally from mm -hmm. that. And so it gets us into some of our complicated immigration policy. If you ask people in Hazleton, they would probably say build the wall. Mm -hmm. Although if you ask Latino voters who are, who are growing in number but are still for the numbers, you probably wouldn't get the same reaction. Mm -hmm. So we get into our complicated immigration politics. So. Fantastic. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. So I, I have I, I, my first question was investment. Tell us about Bimbo. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about another company. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you this. But, you know, because yeah. we do think of the yeah. Mexico-U.S. relationship yeah. in terms of immigration, and we also uh, think of immigration in terms of U.S.-Mexico, both are much bigger topics. Yeah. And that chapter, I think it was chapter three, was yeah. the one about investment. That's the one that grabbed my attention when I knew this book was special and it was different. Can, can you talk about some of the other trends that you noticed in investment, some of the dollar figures? Like the, just thinking of how many baked goods we have is, is one thing, and maybe even more powerful than, than data. Because I grew up eating English, you know, Thomas English muffins. That was, my mom was frustrated. We didn't eat anything else for a couple of years. So to think now that that's, uh, you know, a Mexican company wanted to invest in that, and, and there's an, an investor or a group of investors that believe in America and forging that relationship. I think you get into some of that, too, beyond the, just the shock value. But tell, tell us some more about investment, and maybe whenever you write a book, there are things that are left on the cutting room floor. You just end up editing out some, some juicy material. What, what, on, what on this economic relationship uh, was, was left out of the book? You know, I didn't get to all the cases that I want on the economic relationship. So, I mean, you know, Borden Milk, for example, is I, I do actually have an interview with the CEO of, of, of Lala, which is Borden Milk in the United States. So a number of our, our major milk brands are actually owned by a Mexican company, um, TrackPhone, you know, the largest prepaid cell phone. Anyone who spent time in Latin America knows a lot of people use prepaid cell phones, mm -hmm. right? It is. So, you know, Mexican company, you know, Carlos Slim moves into the U.S. market, think he's going to, you know, start a prepaid cell phone um, uh, service that will serve uh, basically Mexican immigrants, maybe Latin American immigrants, and finds out there's a bunch of young Americans that really like the idea of a prepaid cell phone. It's all their parents will allow them to do, right? You know, put a little bit of money on it, that's all you can use for the month, and it takes off. And so the model that came out of Latin America ends mm -hmm. up, um, drinkable yogurt is also a big thing in Latin oh, America, right. which yeah. is becoming a big thing in the United States, but it's been a big thing in Latin America for a long time. So Lala actually gets in using drinkable yogurt, selling to Mexicans, and then figures out it sells to a, a larger population. Um, and the where, French and, and you play were figuring and that and out. And where time. are they selling, though? Yeah. Are they trying to sell it in boutique, you know, uh, ethnic stores? It's funny, almost all the Mexican companies that move into the U.S. think they're moving into the Mexican migrant market. Yeah. Now, there's some, there are a couple exceptions to that. For the most part, they move in, they think we've got a product, we can sell it to um, migrants, we've got our own people on the side of the border, we'll start investing. And then they realize, as one CEO said to me at one point, I don't think I included this because that was an informal conversation a few years ago, he said, you know, we were trying to sell to Mexican migrants and we figured out we couldn't differentiate mm -hmm. who we were selling to, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we were selling to a bunch of other Americans, whatever Americans are, right? People will sort of, and so we just realized, let's just go in and to the U.S. market, right? I mean, that is, yeah. that's been, Bimbo was the same way. They started off selling with a little plant in California, trying to sell to Mexican mm -hmm. migrants. And then realized, you know, if you're going to do that, you might as well go into the full these are, market. These are case studies of what we would call foreign direct investment, right? Where you mm -hmm. have a company that's making a strategic move. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, is it matched by portfolio investment where Mexicans yes. are buying stocks in, in the U.S. market? 
Very much so. In fact, Mexicans invest more in the U.S. market than Americans do in the Mexican market. That's probably not surprising. The U.S. market is a safe bet for Mexicans, right? So it's where a lot of people... But, there, yeah, the huge portfolio investment in the U.S. Mm. And then some of it is... I mean, the story that, that I was going to touch on, this is in, in south, southeast Missouri, in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, um, is the largest nail plant in the United States. N nails are an industry that have really gone down. I mean, nails really matter, by the way, because otherwise we'd be, you know, out here on 13th Street or New York Avenue having this conversation in the rain, which would be really unfortunate, or we'd have a tent over our heads or something. Um, so nails matter, right? It's one of those things you don't care about until you realize you need one, right? Um, the U.S. nail industry has been really hard hit by mostly Chinese imports, right? Chinese steel, subsidized, coming in, you make nails out of it, put the U.S. nail industry out of business. There's one large company, left. there are about five or six companies left, but there's one large company that's half the U.S. production um, in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, near our Arkansas border, and it gets its steel from Mexico. So they say to a Mexican company, northern Mexico, sends the steel up on a train, um, and they make nails out of it mm. at, the, at the nail plant. 2013, the owner decides to sell it. He's tired of competing. He's done this a long time. Were, he sells it to De Acero. Turns out the largest nail company in the United States is owned by a Mexican company. Mm -hmm. Mexican steel company none of us have ever heard of. <clears throat> I'd never heard of this story until I was doing the book and someone pointed this out to me along the way. Turns out the U.S. nail industry is saved by a Mexican company, mm -hmm. oddly enough. Um, and they've been very successful. They've been somewhat hit by the steel tariffs. There was actually a Washington Post story on this because they have been hit. But, you know, here you have Mexican steel, American nails integrated together because NAFTA until the steel tariffs. And the factory, allowed. which has been around for a long time, yeah. but the factory would have died. This is a factory yeah. in the Ozarks, right? In the Ozarks, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they've actually expanded by about a third of the workforce since, wow. since they bought it. So they've done very well. They, they contracted a little bit the past year with the steel tariffs, but, but still, still over where they were initially. And it, it tells another truth about Mexican investment in the U.S. and U.S. investment in Mexico, which is largely this is investment, you know, in, in shared production. You know, some things are like you know, we, we are selling soybeans to Mexico, Mexicans sell strawberries to us. But a lot of the investment that goes on is actually industries where people are making things on both sides of the border. Mm -hmm. So you have this, I mean, the biggest one is cars, right? We all thought at some point cars, the auto industry, for those of us old enough to remember this, the auto industry was going out of business in the 1980s, right? All cars would be imported. Very hard to find an imported car in the United States today. You have to really look hard, um, unless you count Mexico and Canada as imports, but most Mexican and it, cars that are assembled in Mexico and Canada um, are mostly U.S. content, right? right? I mean, right. this is sort of North American content, and most cars in North America are still actually final assembly in the U.S. Fifty-seven percent, I think, is is last time I checked was U.S. assembly. Um, almost all cars. If, if anyone's been in a vehicle today, we've all probably been in a vehicle of some kind. Um, it almost certainly has parts from Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And it was made in a seamless, just in time. You're talking about Toyotas project. and Hondas? Toyotas and, and Hondas, all the rest. I mean, there was a time when we figured everyone would be driving around an imported Toyota. For the most part, if you're driving a Toyota, you're probably driving a Toyota made in North America right. at this point, right. or a Nissan, or, you know. But most of the car companies decided to actually make their cars in North America, yeah. which is surprising. I mean, none of us would have predicted this. Now, now, it's not just because of NAFTA. It's not just because of Mexico and Canada. It's also because the car companies got smart. Um, there were changes in the law. I mean, there a lot of things happened that we could analyze that go beyond my knowledge base. But but part of it was creating this shared production platform in North America. And, and we've seen this in appliances and other areas where the U.S. would be less competitive if we weren't building across so, three So countries. the surprise is that you didn't write this book and then the Trump presidency happened. Mm -hmm. You wrote this book about how this is almost an inevitable integration Right, between these two societies. And you talk not only about the Trump um, administration, almost in hindsight, like it, it's, part of, it's part of what's happening, but the, um, the New Mexican president, Obrador, right, yeah. correct? Um, and you say he may not become president. Well, he, he is. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but I think it's sort of fascinating that you, you had this all in mind, and yet you still see this overwhelming trend. Yeah. Let me put on my skeptic's hat, because I'm... I like a lot of what you write. I want to believe it's all true, but I can hear, you know, the whispers of family members who maybe don't agree. And, and there's a part of my brain that thinks, really, aren't there real problems in Mexico that are, are maybe intractable? The corruption and the crime, are, uh, the, 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 the MS-13 the president talks about a lot. Those are those are real issues, right? Uh, are you confident that they'll be overcome? No. <laughs> Um, I, I'm confident, you know, I, I got to writing this and it was January of 
20, it was it was right around the time of the inauguration. So my editor sends me a note and says, "Okay, you've written an entire book saying that the U.S. and Mexico are getting closer. Do you still believe this? You owe me a conclusion." <laughs> um, you know, and so I'm I'm writing this in the shadow of the inauguration, saying, "Do I actually still believe this?" And and there was a moment. So I had to sit down. I, I spent a few days thinking about what I was going to do. I said, yeah, I actually still believe this. I mean, I, and, I, and I think we're seeing a natural reaction against a relationship that is becoming in, intense between the two countries, but also a relationship that does have some real problems. And so let's go to the problems. I mean, I, th I think there really are, this is an asymmetric relationship. So the first thing Mexicans would tell you is, I mean, Mexicans, you know, Jim spent time in Mexico. You know, Mexicans fear this integration also because for them, we are the big neighbor that does not really have their interests at heart, right? We're a bigger neighbor that, that demands, can demand what we want of them. So a lot of Mexicans are skeptical of this relationship. The U.S. is a global power. You know, they're going to get crushed by us, right? So still there's a, Lopez Obrador, the new president of Mexico, comes a little bit out of that, right? I mean, he's tempered it as he's become president, but he is, he comes a little bit out of the old sort of leftist view mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm of the United States that this is a dangerous neighbor next door, don't get too close because they'll eat you up, right? And, and that is real sense of Mexicans. Mexico's got its own set of problems. I mean, some of them has to do with the asymmetric economies. One, one of the stories in the book with De Acero, the nail, I'll tell you the other side of the nail plant story. When the CEO of De Acero comes for his first meeting with the workers at the nail plant company, he finds a bunch of guys who are a lot larger than him. I can't remember exactly how he put it there, slightly more politically correct, but not really politically correct. But, you know, a bunch of guys who could, you know, take him on pretty easily, and he, he is a sort of, you know, short Mexican executive looking out at them, telling them he's taken over the company, and, you know, he's looking forward to them working together, and they all, they're all thinking, he's going to pink slip us and move this company to Mexico, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and they think that not because they're a bunch of xenophobes, but because they just moved the air conditioning plant down across the, you know, literally across the same industrial park to Mexico. And they moved it to exactly the same place where the steel plant is, to Saltillo, Coahuila. So, I mean, you know, they have every reason in the world to believe that that's about what he's about to do. He bought this plant, and he's about, you know, he's going to mm -hmm. keep it going just long enough to actually move it to Mexico. Um, the, I can tell you there's a lot of evidence out there, and, I, and it's in the book, when people, when companies invest in Mexico, U.S. companies invest in Mexico, they almost always invest in the United States, on average. I mean, there's, there tends to be, people tend to be expanding operations on both sides. But on, we don't live in the average, right? Mm -hmm. if, you're in, if you worked in the, in the nail plant, you did pretty well. You came out well from that average. If you worked in the air conditioning plant, the average does nothing for you because you lost your job, mm -hmm. right? And there was a lot of restructuring around NAFTA, and there was a lot of restructuring. You know, people did move things to Mexico. Yeah. And, and by the way, Mexican companies got put out of business by bigger U.S. companies, the things Mexicans were concerned about, right? Is that, you know, U.S. companies are going to come in and be able to outcompete them? Well, that happened, too. So Mexicans mm -hmm. lost their jobs, and Americans lost their jobs. I actually have a story in here which ends up being a good news story, but it starts out as a pretty bad one, with a clothing company in Chihuahua, on the Mexican side that gets put out of business, this is a historical company in the city of Chihuahua, gets put out of business because they can't compete, um, and that's actually with Asian imports, but it's in the context of the World Trade Organization, yep, they get yep. put out of business. They end up finding a niche in the aerospace industry. They end up actually sewing the cushions and, and all the interiors that go into to aerospace. Chihuahua's a big aerospace center. And so they reinvent themselves as an aerospace company. And so there's a, a fun interview with the CEO, there's two brothers. Um, how they kind of dis rediscover that you can actually sew for other things, right? Um, and, and it works out. But, but there's a lot of disruption that happens. The second thing in Mexico, in terms of asymmetry, is obviously corruption and crime, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Mexico has, you know, every time there's a negotiation between the U.S. and Mexican governments on anything, the people walk away, have a great conversation.